ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಗಣಪತಿ ಹವಾಮಹೆ ಕವಿ ಕವೀನಾಪಮಶ್ರವಸ್ತಮ ಜ್ಯೇಷ್ಠರಾಜ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮಣಸ್ಪತ ಆನಶೃಣ್ವನ್ನೂತಿಸೀದ ಸಾಧನ ಪ್ರಣೋ ದೇವಿ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ಬಾಜೆ ಭರ್ಭಾಜನೀವತಿ ದೀನಾಮಿತ್ರಿಯವತು ಗಣೇಶಾಯ ನಮಃ ಸರಸ್ವತ್ಯೈ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಪುರುಷಸ್ಯ ವಿಮಸಹಸ್ರಾಕ್ಷಸ್ಯ ಮಹಾದೇವಸ್ಯ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ರುದ್ರ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ತತ್ಪುರುಷಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಮಹಾದೇವಾಯ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ರುದ್ರ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ತತ್ಪುರುಷಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ವಕ್ರತುಂಡಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ದಂತಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ತತ್ಪುರುಷಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಚಕ್ರತುಂಡಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ನಂದಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ತತ್ಪುರುಷಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಮಹಾಸೇನಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನ ಷಣ್ಮುಖ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ತತ್ಪುರುಷಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಸುವರ್ಣ ಪಕ್ಷಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ಗರುಡ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಮೇಧಾತ್ಮನಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಹಿರಣ್ಯ ಗರ್ಭಾಯ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ಓ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ನಾರಾಯಣಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ವಿಷ್ಣು ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ವಜ್ರಣಕಾಯ ವಿಮಹೆ ತೀಕ್ಷ್ಣದೃಷ್ಟಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ನಾರಸಿಗುಂಹ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಭಾಸ್ಕರ ವಿಮಹೆ ಮಹದ್ಯುತಿಕರಾಯ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ಆದಿತ್ಯ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ವೈಶ್ವಾಣರಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಲಾಲೀಲಾ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ಅಗ್ನಿ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಕಾತ್ಯಾಯನಾ ವಿಮಹೆ ಕನ್ಯಕುಮಾರಿ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನೋ ದುರ್ಗೆ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಸಾಯೀಶ್ವರಾಯ ವಿಮಹೆ ಸತ್ಯದೇವಾಯ ಧೀಮಹಿ ತನ್ನ ಸರ್ವ ಪ್ರಚೋದಯ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಸ್ವಸ್ತಿ ಪ್ರಜಾಭ್ಯ ಪರಿಪಾಲಯಂತ ನ್ಯಾಯೇಣ ಮಾರ್ಗೇಣ ಮಹಿಮಹಿಷಾ ಗೋಬ್ರಾಹ್ಮಣೇಭ್ಯ ಶುಭಮಸ್ತು ನಿತ್ಯ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಲೋಕಾ ಸುಖಿನೋ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಲೋಕಾ ಸುಖಿನೋ ಸಮಸ್ತ ಲೋಕಾ ಸುಖಿನೋ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಸಾಯಿರಾಮ್ ಮೈ ಹಂಬಲ್ ಪ್ರಣಾಮ್ಸ್ ಎಟ್ ದ ಲೋಟಸ್ ಫೀಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಭಗವಾನ್ ವಿತ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಪ್ಲೆಜರ್ ಐ ವುಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಟು ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಆಗಸ್ಟ್ ಆಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಮಿಸಸ್ ವಿದ್ಯುಲತಾ ಮಹೇಶ್ ವಿದ್ಯುಲತಾ ವಾಸ್ ಬ್ಲೆಸ್ಡ್ ಟು ಬಿ ಬಾರ್ನ್ ಇನ್ ಅ ಸಾಯಿ ಲವಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ಯಾಮಿಲಿ ಹ ಪೇರೆಂಟ್ ಪೆಟರ್ನಲ್ ಗ್ರ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಪೇರೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಜಡ್ಜ್ ದಾಮೋದರ್ ರಾವ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಮಿಸಸ್ ಪದ್ಮ ದಾಮೋದರ್ ರಾವ್ and her maternal grandparents dr sundar rao and mrs leela sundar rao were appointed as the first state president and mahila vibhag presidents 
for the states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka respectively by Swami. Her father, Professor Dr. D. Narendra, served as the first principal of Swami's college in Vrindavan. On a visit to her grandparents' home in Madras, now called Chennai, in 1967, Swami asked her brother Bharat whether he would like a little brother or a sister. He replied, a little sister, Swami. Swami blessed him with a little sister the next year and named her Vidyulata. She did her schooling in Bangalore and studied in Swami's college in Anantapur between 1984 to 1989. Swami performed her wedding in 1989 to Dr. Mahesh Narayan and they moved to the UK where she went on to train as a teacher and work in the field of education. She is currently working as a manager in the inclusion, special education needs and disability services providing education support services to schools, children, and families. She and her husband are active members of the Sri Satyasai Seva Organization, United Kingdom, and she has held various posts, including National Balvikas, SSE Coordinator, and National Vice President of the UK. She continues to be active in the field of Balvikas. Having been associated with Vidyulata through school, college, and beyond, she has always come across as a charming, kind, quiet, unassuming, ever helpful person. A quiet worker behind the scenes who is not very fond of limelight. So without much ado, I would like to invite upon Vidyulata to share her experiences with us today. Om Shri Sai Ram. My most loving, and prayerful pranams at Bhagwan's divine lotus feet. Respected elders, brothers and sisters, Sairam to all of you. I recall this bus journey that I took as a school-age child with my family members from Bangalore to Puttaparthi. This was a journey that we used to do very often. On this particular journey, I was thinking to myself and pretty happy with myself as well, because I knew when I get to Prashantanilayam, it was only good times ahead. And I was also thinking that Swami was mine. He belonged to my folks and somehow I was special. Anyway, the journey progressed and I so happened to listen in on a conversation that was taking place in the seat right behind mine. It was two ladies who were very excitedly and joyfully talking about Swami, sharing their stories and their experiences. It suddenly felt like I was sitting with my own family members in my own home and often listening to those very stories and experiences. They were saying, and Swami said this, you know, and he did this, and he wrote this, and this went on. I suddenly was jolted out of my complacent world. And I realized that this Swami who I thought was mine, was not mine alone. Although he made me feel like he would belong to only me, and I mattered. He belonged to every devotee. And every devotee's life is an unwritten book waiting to be told. So I'm here before you with deep gratitude to Bhagwan and with all humility to share a few of my experiences and that of my families with Bhagwan. These were very cherished moments for us and the most special moments too. There was never a time in our lives where Swami did not make his presence known. For us, he was the head of our household. He was there to advise, to guide, to counsel, to correct our mistakes, to protect us from harm. But most of all, he was there showering his love and compassion as he drew each and every one of us into his fold. So I thought today I take this opportunity to share 
some of my experiences growing up as a child, and in particular, some of those moments when Swami visited our homes. Now, Swami's visits would often be planned visits, but often would also be what we called surprise visits. So there was this one time when Swami decided to play a prank on us. And this was definitely a surprise visit. So my father, Professor D. Narendra, who was the first principal of Bhagwan's College in Vrindavan, for the first 10 years of his principalship, he used to commute from Bangalore to Vrindavan. And in those days, there used to be one direct bus from where we lived, which was near Alsur, to uh, Kadugudi. And that would be one in the morning and one direct bus returning in the evening. Now, in those days, Swami spent most of his time in Vrindavan. And so my father, when Swami was there, would remain back at the end of the college day to report to Swami the daily uh, matters of the college and then would return on the, on the bus. One such evening, and he would normally come home by about 7.30. One such evening, my mother and us children were waiting at home and it was 7.30, expecting my father to walk in any time. 7.30 came and went and there was no sign of my father. And I could sense that there was anxiety and worry written all over my mother's face. And soon enough, there was a knock on the front door. So my mother hastily went to the front door and partly was going to open it, but noticed that just under the gap of the door, between the door and the ground, there was a bit of an orange fabric showing because the light of the veranda was on, she noticed this orange fabric. We were not expecting anybody at that time. So she opened the door partly and lo and behold to her utter surprise, who is standing there but Swami himself. So she immediately opened the rest of the door and exclaimed, Swami! And us children immediately ran as well to the door. And yes, Swami was standing right there and he asked her, he said, where is principal? Has he come home? My mother very anxiously answered, no, Swami, he has not come yet. Then Swami looked at her and said, well, I finished the session early today in Vrindavan, so he should have come home by now. Of course, my mother did not have any answer to give other than probably her heart rate was beating thousand a minute in total panic. And then Swami sensed that anxiety, I suppose. And he quickly said, hey, principal, come out from there. And Swami had put him behind the door. And my father stepped out from behind the door. And then Swami smiled. And so did we. And he said, you see, I was coming to the city to visit a devotee's home. So I brought principal with me so that I can drop him en route. And so he came and dropped my father at home. He got back into the car and he drove back to Brindavan. In a jiffy, Swami just took away all that anxiety and worry. Swami always managed to keep us on our toes. And I remember this particular visit. Again, we were children. And as we lived in the area of Alsur, and if those of you are familiar, there's a big lake. Every year, there used to be a, a regatta uh, boat festival that would take place. And it was an annual treat for us children to attend that uh, regatta. And along with that, my very loving aunt and uncle would treat us uh, post the boat races 
to a, a restaurant where we would get some masala dosas and some snacks and we would stroll back home. And that was one of those occasions. We did all of that and we strolled back home and walked in and we just, you know, removed our slippers, our footwear and just left them in a real disarray in the veranda. And we went in to, to kind of start telling my mother and grandmothers, you know, what we had witnessed, etc. So as we were inside, suddenly there was a bit of a commotion and my brother came in and said, Swami has come, Swami has come. Uh, he was dismissed away saying, don't do such things. But he persisted and he said, no, but Swami has come. Anyway, so one of the elders went out and sure enough, Swami's car was driving in. It was quite a long drive into our home. So from the gate to reach the portico and sure enough, Swami's car was literally driving in to the portico. So you can imagine the pandemonium and the scramble that happened following that. Now, my grandfather, Dr. M.B. Sundar Rao, was the first to rush out and step down into the portico to welcome Swami. Swami very sweetly was getting out of his car. But what was in view right in front of Swami was this huge disarray of footwear that was scattered across the veranda. So my elders immediately got us to gather that footwear and quickly put it into the room that was just literally adjacent to the veranda. And the footwear was dumped into that room and the door was shut. Swami glided up the stairs, the steps, slowly talking to the elders and came into the veranda. And we were all standing there. And what did he do next? He suddenly turned and looked at the door adjacent, the door that we had just shut with all the footwear behind it. And he said, so, Sundara, where does that door go to? And my grandfather had not realized that that's where the footwear had been dumped. And he said, Swami, that is my clinic room. My grandfather was a senior ophthalmologist and he had his clinic in our home. At that moment, my aunt, along with us little helpers, quickly anticipated what was going to happen. And she ran through the house into the bedroom that connected to the clinic. So it was all kind of interconnected, the rooms. And quickly we gathered the footwear, as you can imagine, and put it out from that room into the bedroom, but didn't stop there. She said, no, let's put it in the bathroom, which was attached to the bedroom. And she stood by the bathroom door, literally barricading herself very strategically. And of course, my grandfather took Swami into the clinic room. All of this felt like as if time was still at that point when all of us were scrambling around. It was like Swami had just stopped time, but we could do all of these things at the same time. And it felt like everything was moving very seamlessly. Swami came into the clinic room. He looked at all the equipment that my grandfather had. And then he looked at the door that was attached to the room next. And he said, so where does that door go to? <laughs> so my grandfather immediately said, Swami, that goes into the room of the house, the main house, the bedroom. And so he opened that. And of course, Swami stepped into the, the main bedroom. Of course, my, grand, uh, my aunt was very strategically standing by the door of the bathroom. And there was no way, hopefully, that Swami would want and ask her to move to find out what was behind that door. <laughs> Swami, of course, did not. He came back into the main living uh, room and of course carried on with the rest of the visit. 
it was a surprise visit, so nothing was really planned to welcome Swami. Um, what Swami would normally do on those surprise visits was he would come, he would go into the puja room, and my mother would always have the arati ready. And my mother was always fond of the uh, the garlands um, that she would offer to Swami's picture and one to the Devi picture. So the garland that was there, she they offered to Swami, which in those days Swami would accept. He would accept and wear the garland, and then arati would be taken. There was always in those days Swami used to eat pan, so we would always have pan bida ready. So that was offered as as uh, an offering uh, to Swami, and then he would make his way uh, back uh, to Vrindavan or to wherever Swami was visiting um, in the city. An important lesson for me and as us as children at that time was that there is nothing we can hide from Swami. And also, Swami, we have to be always ready. Swami can come anytime and we have to be ready. One of the things that Swami encouraged for us children to do was to learn bhajans to learn prayers, to learn Vedic chants. And thankfully, my two grandmothers, Mrs. Leela Sundar Rao and Mrs. Padma Damodar, were so rooted in the Balvikas movement when Swami initially started it in the, the late 60s. And as their roles of being Mahila Vibhag chairpersons, they were that was the main role for them was to promote the Balvikas movement in all areas. So we were very fortunate as children to have them both as our first gurus. And they both encouraged us to learn bhajans, to learn uh, prayers, to learn Vedic chants. And the only reason, it was simple. The reason was very simple. Swami enjoyed it. We have to do things to please Swami. So my grandmother, Mrs. Leela Sundar Rao, uh, wanted us to learn the Vedic chants. And on one occasion, Swami had given us the intimation that he would be visiting my grandparents' home. At that time, they were living in Jai Mahal in Bangalore. And that he would be arriving uh, on a particular date and time. So this was one of those planned announced visits. So there was time to prepare, there was time to arrange, make all the arrangements and you know to welcome Swami. And one of the things as part of those arrangements was that she was keen for us children, that is me and my two cousins, to learn a Vedic chant. And so we learned the Narayana Suktam. And this, we had a wonderful uh, tutor, a master who would come and uh, diligently teach us the Narayana Suktam. And this was uh, with the view that we would be able to, if Swami permitted, offer it to him when he visited the home. So as the day of the visit came, Swami came, and Swami very graciously agreed for us children to chant. So we went into the puja room and Swami came into the puja room and he stood and we chanted the entire Narayana Suktam. And Swami stood there for that entire time, nodding, gesturing to us, giving us that encouraging look, saying, you are right, go on, carry on. And he listened. He gave us that uninterrupted attention and that vote of confidence that we were doing right by him. And that vote of confidence instilled in me to do more, to learn more. And this is where the Balvikas program took seed in my heart. I was a very enthusiastic Balvikas student. 
I would not alone, just not attend just my grandmother's class. I would go and attend the class that was in the Alsur uh, Samiti, a very dear and revered uh, guru, Sir uh, Sri Tyagarajan, our uh, revered uh, Ravi Kumar, sir, the warden of the Brindavan Hostel, his father, who was my guru, a very, very loving teacher. I used to also accompany my mother, who used to go and teach in the army barracks, Balvikas. So during the week, I would accompany her. And that used to be quite a fun experience because the army people would send the big truck to pick us up. And we had to haul ourselves into it. And along with some other uh, children, we would, we would go to the army barracks to have our Valvikas class. So, and when I went for my holidays to Chennai to my grandparents, I would attend Balvikas there. So Balvikas was something I so looked forward to. And that was all because of the, the dedication and the loving gurus that were our teachers. And, and that encouraged me to learn, to sing, to chant, and with the only purpose that this will please Swami. So I'm going to transport you now to Chennai, to Madras. This was another very special visit. Swami very frequently visited Madras in those times. And one of those visits invariably, Swami would uh, graciously visit my grandparents, Judge Damodar Rao and Mrs. Padma Damodar Rao's home in Adiyar. So one of these visits, it was a planned visit. So lots of arrangements were being made. The elders were busy uh, you know, with uh, the preparations. And us children, that is my two older cousin sisters, my brother and myself, also wanted to do something for Swami. So a plan was hatched by us children. It was agreed, and this was a big secret, the elders were not privy to this, that my brother would go up a tree that was right at the entrance to the gate of the house. It was a beautiful cherry blossom tree. So there were lots of blossoms. And when Swami's car would drive in, he would shake the branches of the tree so that all the blossoms will fall on Swami's car. So we, we thought as children, that was a great idea. So it was a secret. I was the youngest amongst the four of us. So um, I was sworn to secrecy. And my two older cousin sisters, they were very artistic. So they decided that they would put a beautiful rangoli design as a backdrop to where Swami's chair would be placed, where he would sit in the living room. And there used to be a cupboard, a wooden cupboard behind there. It used to be bare. So they said, let's cover that with a beautiful rangoli. And so the, the, the creative side in them came out and they said, we'll draw, draw the rangoli as the Sarvadharma stupa. So as the arrangements were being made, there were lots of flowers that were ordered. So part of those flowers we, we plucked, I was given the job of plucking the little petals so that they could then stick a petal at a time and make that rangoli design for the backdrop that would just frame Swami's seat. The day arrived and everybody, all the elders had their roles and duties uh, as you would uh, when Swami came. What they didn't notice was there was a boy up a tree. <laughs> and usually when Swami's car turned into the, the road that, where our house was, there would be a signal, somebody be at the end of the road, you know how you get that signal. Swami's car's turned and you know, all of that. So that, that signaling system, no mobiles, but the signaling system seemed to work perfectly. And as Swami drove in, there was the shower of the blossoms. And suddenly there was this rain of blossoms that fell on Swami's car. And of course, Swami's car glided into the, uh, to the driveway 
and stopped in front of the house where my grandfather was. And, and you can imagine my grandfather had the look of utter horror on his face because he had no idea that this was going to happen. Swami got out of the car with the most amused look. By then my brother had come down from the tree. And that amused look removed the tension that was written all over my grandfather's face. And Swami very sweetly just tapped my brother's cheek. And then he was led into the house and he was welcomed into the house. And then finally, when he went and sat at the chair, Swami turned right round to face the Rangoli design. And he so sweetly appreciated that Rangoli and said how beautiful it was. And then Swami um, signed for us children to come forward. All four of us went forward and he said, take Padanamaskar. And we did that and went and sat in our allotted places. Swami showed us that he does not miss anything. Nothing goes unnoticed for Swami. He responds to the smallest of gestures that we may offer to him. As long as the intention is there to please Swami. Our family came into Swami's fold when tragedy had struck. I am the youngest of three siblings. It's my oldest brother, Vijay Sai, whom Swami renamed as Vijay Sai, had been struck with a very debilitating illness, which meant he lost his sight, his speech, his movement. He was a very healthy child till the, up until the age of four. And suddenly, at the age of four, he started to lose these faculties. And of course, medical science did not have any answers. And at that time is when you start to seek answers. Where medical science has no answers, you seek answers elsewhere. That is beyond the realm of science. And it is at that time that Swami drew our family in the early 60s into his fold. And during Vijay Sai's lifetime, Swami visited our home so frequently. In fact, when Vijay Sai, my brother, passed away at the age of 16, Swami insisted for him to be brought to Prashantanilayam for the cremation. Swami personally made all the arrangements for the last rites to be held on the banks of the river Chitravati. And soon after, when the very dejected and despairing family members, including my father, returned to Bangalore, Swami followed them. He came immediately to Brindavan and came home to Alsur that very evening to console, to comfort, to give my mother and the rest of our family the much needed strength. At that visit, Swami said, Vijay Sai was our Kula Guru. Those were the words who brought all of you to me. So with great fondness, I recall this very touching episode on one of those visits that Swami made to our home. So 
when Swami arrives and when Swami comes to the home, you know, everybody is so busy preparing and making sure everything goes right. And, you know, in the process, they, they forgot that Vijay Sai was left in the bedroom. Of course, he at that time did not uh, have his sight, but he still had his sense of hearing. He was very uh, mentally um, awake and he had a little bit of his speech. And so he was very softly singing a bhajan, Sai Baba Gita Sudha. Madhuram, Madhuram, Anandam, quietly to himself in the room. And what did Swami do? He didn't know that Swami had tiptoed into the room and st stopped right behind his chair. And as he was singing, Sai Baba, Gita Sudha, Swami finished the next line saying, Madhuram, Madhuram, Anandam, singing it. And my brother immediately sensed and said, Kon, Baba. And Swami profusely blessed my brother and spent time with him. The world may forget us, but our Swami will never. So moving forwards, 1980 was a, a, a great year for us because Swami, the compassionate Swami, blessed my parents with a permanent home in Brindavan. So the apartment that Swami gave us was within the um, Brindavan residences. And in those days, you know, Swami, living in Swami's presence meant to expect the unexpected. Anything can happen at any time. And I recall very often Swami would sometimes walk amongst the, the residence's complex, either to go and inspect something or to go and visit a, a, a devotee. So on one such occasion, my grandparents, my paternal grandparents had come from um, Madras to, to Brindavan, my grandmother was to undergo a cataract operation, which um, was to take place in the Whitefield General Hospital. So she had undergone the operation. Of course, anything big or small, uh, Swami would always be consulted. And on this occasion too. And therefore the operation was taking place in the Whitefield Hospital. It went ahead, it, was, it all went uh, fine. And uh, it was also my father reported back and my grandfather reported back to Swami saying, Swami, the operation went well. Of course, uh, my grandmother, because she had had the operation, could not go for any darshans. And I, I guess, you know, silently she was yearning for that, that darshan. And her way of expressing her yearning was to sing she used to sing well. So she used to sing Tyagraja Kritis. She would chant prayers. She would sing bhajans. That was her way of expressing her, her desire to see Swami. So it was one of those days where my mother was busy in the kitchen preparing the family uh, lunch. And she had not noticed that there was quite a commotion downstairs near the uh, residences. And suddenly the door bell rang. Of course, what the commotion was that Swami had come to, towards the residences and was climbing up the stairway to the apartment block to our apartment, which was number one on the B floor. So when the doorbell rang, she, you know, she was in the midst of her daily, her daily chores and my grandmother was lying in, in the inner room in, on her bed. And it was, it so happened, my brother was also there. So when she opened the door, who was standing there? But Swami, along with a couple of other um, senior devotees. Thankfully, my brother had the, the presence of mind 
to get the camera and capture these moments. So we, we do have a couple of photographs taken at that time with Swami. Swami came in, unknowing to my grandmother who was lying on the bed, went straight into the inner room. And you can imagine the, the, the shock, but also the joy that permeated throughout our home. My, my mother quickly pulled the chair because there was, there was, we had not prepared. So we had Vijay Sai's chair where it always held an idol of Shirdi Baba. So my mother removed the Shirdi Baba idol and pulled the chair and placed the chair for Swami to sit right next to my grandmother's cot, the bed. And Swami sat by her bedside and spoke to her, materialized vibhuti and applied it on her operated eye. And then Swami did the most compassionate thing. He said to my grandmother, you cannot bend. So let me, I will lift my feet up so that you can touch my feet. And that is what the compassionate Lord did. He raised his feet to the bed level so that my grandmother could touch his divine feet and place it on her eyes. It was a very short and sweet visit, but a visit that healed a yearning heart. Swami's Parshan, Darshan and Sambhashan was enough to heal, to cure, to bring joy into our lives. This yearning, this desire to please Swami and to be near Him was something I, as a child, was observing through the examples that was before me in the form of all my elders. And so this yearning became pretty strong in me. And I thought the next best thing that I could do to be near Swami was to join his school. So it was a deep desire of mine to study in Swami school. And at that time, the school that I could join if Swami permitted was the Srimati Ishwarama High School in Puttaparthi. And they did take students uh, for uh, those who came from in, an English medium school, they would still take them because they did offer uh, us uh, teaching in the English medium as well at that time. So I pestered my father every time I would say to him, please ask Swami if I can enroll, please ask Swami if I can enroll. The answer was not forthcoming at all. There was no answer in fact. So I wasn't sure whether my father was asking Swami or was Swami not giving the answer. So on one occasion where the family were in Puttaparthi and were called for an interview, I mustered up the courage myself and I boldly stepped forward and asked Swami, Swami, please can I join your school? And he very sweetly looked at me and then looked at my father and he said, no, you stay with your parents now, but you come and join my college in Anantapur. Of course, once Swami says that, there is no room for negotiation. You cannot question, it's, the answer is final and that was it. And again, I'm very grateful to my elders for teaching us children not to take Swami for granted. They instilled in us that feeling of awe and reverence and to maintain that, that feeling of awe and reverence because Swami was the omniscient 
omnipotent and omnipresent God. He was God himself. So my life from school finished and began as a student in Anantapur. I joined for the intermediate and the five years that I spent in Anantapur were the best years a student could ever experience. It was an atmosphere of a loving home away from home. Our teachers who were extremely dedicated, loving and devoted to Bhagwan gave us those opportunities to be able to again be near his divine lotus feet. My, our warden in fact, Srimati Jayama Madam, would often in her advice to us girls, students, say, this is a training ground, Amma. Anantapur is a training ground. And sure enough, it was indeed a training ground. Knowingly or unknowingly, our talents and skills were tapped into by our teachers who were verily Swami's instruments. We learned so many things. We learned to live together as one family. We learned through our extracurricular activities to be creative, to innovate, to collaborate, to manage with very few resources. These were all things, skills at that time we never thought of, but on reflection, these are all the things that we experience today in our daily life. And that has come in good stead in how we approach life today in whatever we do. So as part of our extracurricular activities and as part of the offerings that we would make to Swami when he would visit our campus, we would want to do something that was very creative and, and very original. So on one such of those visits, I had the opportunity to participate in a skating display. Now, this was quite a, a novel item. So we practiced for months together as, as, as a group and practiced all the different tricks that we could do whilst we were skating so that we could Put, perform in front of Swami when he visited our campus. And Swami very graciously visited that year in 1986 and we performed our skating display in, in, the, in the library, if I'm not mistaken. And Swami was so happy and so impressed that he said, next year you must come and perform in the sports meet in Prashant Nilayam. That was the most amazing and most joyful experience for us as, as students in Anantapur. And so rigorous practice started happening and we more uh, members were involved in, in the display. And for the first time in 1987, we were able to participate in the sports meet in the Vidyagiri uh, Stadium in Prashant Nilayam. And I recall how for the practice sessions, Swami would come to the stadium and, and in that hot sun, you know, make sure we were all okay. We were given water. We were not too tired. 
like a loving mother would, not like a loving mother. He is the mother of mothers. He knew our needs, what we needed, and he provided. And so when we performed the skating uh, display, Swami very sweetly turned around and my father was sitting uh, nearby and so was my maternal grandfather. And to the other devotees around him, he, he's pointed out to me and he said, Chudra na principal ammai, meaning see my principal's daughter. That recognition or that appreciation has carried me through life, knowing that Swami is always watching over us. And another time, Swami was so gracious that we had performed a play called Mirdad for Swami when he visited our campus in Anantapur. And he again insisted that we come and perform that play in Prashantanilayam for the vice chancellor's conference as one of the um, uh, evening uh, programs. This was again a very, very uh, exciting and truly uh, enjoyable experience for all of us participating in that play because it meant being in Prashantanilayam and it also meant that Swami would come for the rehearsals. And, and he did. He came for the rehearsals and he would watch the rehearsal and he would direct us. He would do this, you say it like this. And he would look at our costumes. So the, 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 for the dress rehearsal, Swami came he came and he looked at each one of us and examined our costumes. Was it fit for purpose? And he came to me and he looked at me and he said, what role are you playing? I said, Swami, I'm playing the role of the king. King, this costume is not grand for a king. Of course, we had made our costumes with the resources that we had had. And the next thing I know was Swami sent a brocade material to be given, to be made as a costume for me, for the king. He had sent it saying, this is for the king, make the costume. So the performance went ahead and just before the performance began, Swami came backstage. And Swami is all for perfection. Everything should be in its place as it should be. And he came and checked each and every one of us that our costumes were correct, worn correctly, our makeup was just right. And once he gave the once over for each of us that were in the play, we also were able to take Padanamaskar and he went back down to be seated to watch the program. And I re remember the intent look with which he watched the entire performance. Like a proud father but also like a concerned mother, who, making sure that we did our part to the best we could. And he was the director, so it went as he had planned it to be. Anantapur was indeed the, the most important time in my life because I learned a lot whilst I was there. I was able to learn from my teachers. I was able to learn from my inspiring seniors. And I was able to learn from my own fellow 
classmates and friends. How to live in a loving way, speak in a loving way and help as best as one could. So this experience was a very, very memorable one for me. We were in our final year and Swami every year would visit the campus and we had the, the privilege of being there for those five years where we had Swami visiting every year, not once, sometimes twice. So this was our final year and the date and time had been given for Swami's visit. And when Swami visits, you know, and, and I'm sure my sisters here will, will recall and recollect and how much preparation would go on. Each of us would be involved in some form or another in those preparations. There would be many groups, committees to be doing different things, um, cultural, decoration, cooking, uh, you know, name it, uh, cleaning uh, the campus. We would be cleaning parts of the campus that I don't know why we thought Swami would even go there, but we wanted to clean because we wanted to do something that would make us feel part of that welcoming of Swami. So it so happened that we were all ready, all set to welcome Swami. And the tradition was that Swami would uh, leave Prashantanilayam and when Swami left Prashantanilayam for Anantapur, there would be a phone call that would come from Prashantanilayam to us in the hostel and Jayama Madam, our warden, would walk to the phone which used to be in the main quadrangle part of the hostel and answer the phone. That was the signal to say Swami has left and everybody would then helter skelter run, take our positions and be where we were meant to be. And so all the preparations are done and we were all waiting for that phone to ring. And it usually rang at around 7 a.m. Because it used to take about an hour and a bit for Swami's car to drive from Prashanti to Anantapur. The phone did ring and our warden went and answered the phone. But this time she walked back to her room and that was it. And soon there was this jungle telegraph that went right through the hostel with the message that was conveyed. Swami has canceled the visit. You can imagine the pall of gloom that had descended on us. Everybody was was so shocked. Each of us went away not knowing what to do. Some went away quietly back into their rooms. Some went away with tears rolling down. Everybody was completely numbed by that news. However, at such times when things seem so desperate and sad, there is always a fighting spirit amongst us. And that was in the form of our senior sisters. There were a few of our senior sisters who were very inspirational, who decided that no, we cannot let this go. And what they did was to go and plead with our respected teachers to allow us to pray. And that prayer was in the form of a 12 hour bhajan. Usually our bhajans were for an hour. There was a very strict routine that we were all, you know, would follow in the hostel. So a 12 hour bhajan was something unheard of that was out of sync with whenever, you know, out of the routine. But their pleading somehow worked 
and our teachers agreed for us to do that. That was one time the entire hostel community came into the prayer hall. There was not a dry eye in sight. And we sang our hearts out. The 12 hours went by, we finished at 6 a.m. And we went back to do our own work again because it was a normal college day. So we went about our business. Around seven o'clock, there was, I recall this very distinctly, there was this squeal that kind of ran through the hostel, the sound that ran through the hostel corridors. And that squeal, when it emerged into words, the words were, Swami has left for Anantapur. That was the message that came through. The phone had rung and the message was, Swami has left for Anantapur. Of course, we all scrambled like mad to our allotted duties. Thankfully, all the arrangements were as they were because nothing had been moved or removed in terms of decoration or any of the other things. So at 8.30, around 8.30, Swami's car drove into our campus. As final year students, we were given the opportunity to sit by the portico in the college. Um, that was the chance we had and every final year batch would get. And Swami got out of his car and walked up the few steps into the portico and he looked on either side and he said, prayer, prayer, that is why I'm here. The power of prayer can bring the Lord himself to us. As you can imagine, in my final year, unknown to me, my parents and grandparents were busy seeking to find a suitable boy. And when I was about nine years old, Swami had told my father when he was performing a devotee's wedding, my father used to walk behind Swami in those days when Swami would collect the letters and pass them on and my father would, would, would hold those letters. And he turned around to my father and said, I will perform your daughter's wedding. And when I turned 16, he looked at my father again and said, I have found the boy for your daughter. And so when it was my final year, Swami was in quite a rush to get me married. So he would keep asking, have you found the boy? Have you, what have you done? So he would inquire often about the, the, the way things were going around uh, my, my marriage. And of course, there were proposals that would come. And as I said, you know, we would consult Swami for everything. And, and some of these proposals, my mother would carry in a handbag to Darshan with the hope of showing it to Swami to ask if, you know, that was to be or not. And at Darshan, when she would, when Swami was walking, she would, she looked into a handbag to take out those letters but those particular documents were missing. They would not be there. Anyhow, I finished uh, my final year and Swami played his part in arranging the suitable boy for me. And in a few months, he married me to my husband, Mahesh, in 1989. And it was all with good reason that he was in a hurry to get us married. A year down the line, 
I lost my father. And Swami performed our, our marriage. The day before our marriage, he asked both our families, the groom's side as well as my side, into Trai in the evening before and to, to speak to us. And he was very gracious and he blessed my mother-in-law, my husband, the rest of the family. And then he looked at my husband and myself and he said, the only advice that he gave us, he said, about marriage. He said, marriage is all about adjustment and understanding. And then he paused and then he said, more important understanding. On reflection, that is so true of every relationship. When we have understanding, we are able to accommodate and adjust easily. So we soon left to move to the UK. My husband came here first and I followed suit in a year or so's time as I was still doing my post-graduation in, in Madras, where my in-laws lived. And, you know, one of those things that somehow sometimes, you know, you, you have this in your mind that when you're leaving, you want Swami to give you something, some kind of, of reassurance that he's going to be with you. And uh, it was my, my grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's 80th birthday. And on that occasion, Swami called the whole family to an interview. And this was in, in Trai Brindavan. And I mustered up the courage to say to Swami, Swami, I'm also leaving for UK. Please, can you bless me? And in my heart and in my mind, I was thinking, bless me as in give me some kind of protection. Because that used to be the tradition, you see, in our family, Swami would materialize a pendant or a, or, or a, a statue or something to say, take this with you. Swami very gently and sweetly turned around looked at me and he said, take me in your heart. And those words keep ringing in my heart. And that is what we both have done. We have crossed the seven seas, as they say, and we have been here in the United Kingdom for the last over 28 years now, almost for me. But Swami has kept us connected with him throughout. And that connection with Swami has been through the Balvikas movement for us, both my husband and myself. That has been our life here in the UK. We have learned so much from our brothers and sisters and the children here who are physically far removed from Bhagwan's physical presence. But what we have learned is they have Bhagwan and imbibed Bhagwan and his teachings in their own lives, in their daily lives. And we have come across, and we are very fortunate to have come across so many devotees here who live 
the way Swami wants each one of us to live and conduct ourselves. I'm not sure how much more time I have, but I think I would like to conclude by saying a, a big thank you, first of all, to my beloved Bhagwan for giving me this very special and blessed opportunity to be able to recollect and reconnect with, with him. And also, I feel so recharged with his love by sharing all of my personal experiences with each and every one of you. I'd like to thank the organizers of the Brindavan Samarpan team for giving me this opportunity and coordinating all of this so well. And to my dear sisters, Suparna and Ambika, who my, are my, my classmates from Anantapur, for lovingly sitting through with me for this session and for your very kind and generous words in the introduction. I pray to Swami that he keeps us all near his divine lotus feet always and that we continue to involve him in everything that we do, we say, we think in our daily lives. Sai Ram. Om Shri Sai Ram, offering my loving pranams at the lotus feet of our beloved Mother Sai, it's my pleasure this evening to propose the oath of thanks. Though it has been very strange and unusual for us to host the Samarpan program this way, the silver lining is that we are all still able to connect to speakers and listeners all around the globe. Our speaker this evening, Srimati Vidyulata Narayanan, took us back to our college days when we were all showered with love and grace by our mother's side. Today, we are all fortunate to listen to the divine experiences of our sister. We enjoyed listening to the pranks of Swami, sudden visits of Bhagwan to your residence, and other divine experience or experiences all through your life. On behalf of all of us, I thank Srimati Vidyalata for taking out time and sharing her beautiful journey with Sai. And we pray to Swami to bless her, continue her journey in Sai's path forever. I would like to thank all the organizers of today's program, men and women alumni of Sri Satya Sai Institute of Higher Learning for facilitating a great session today. Nothing is possible without our Swami's grace. I thank our Swami for giving us this wonderful opportunity of virtual satsang in the midst of such trying times. Such samarpan programs help recharge our batteries with positive energy and vibrations. Thank you, Swami. I now request our speaker, Srimati Vidyalata Narayanan, to do the Aarti. <laughs> Jagadish Hare Mata Pe 
ಸ್ಮಿತಾ ಗುರುದೈವ ಮರಿಯಂತೆಯು ನೀವೆ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಮರಿಯಂತೆಯು ನೀವೆ ನಾದ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಜಗನ್ನಾಥ ನಾದ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮ ಜಗನ್ನಾಥ ನಾಗೇಂದ್ರಾಶಯನ ಓಂ ಜಯ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರೇ ಸಾಯಿ ಮಹಾದೇವ ಸತ್ಯ ಸಾಯಿ ಮಹಾದೇವ ಮಂಗಲ ಆರತಿ ಅಂದು ಮಂಗಲ ಆರತಿ ಅಂದು ಮಂದರಗಿರಿಧಾರಿ ಓಂ ಜಯ ಜಗದೀಶ ಹರಿ ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಸತ್ಯ ನಾರಾಯಣ ನಾರಾಯಣ ಜೈ ಸಾಯಿರಾಮ್